This video is going to go through a non-calculator FRQ. This uh, question did not come from the College Board. This question came from the publishing company that does our weekly problems and some of the practice tests that we've taken in class. So I do not have a defined rubric as we go over, so I'll kind of give you my best guess as to where the nine points would come from. But it is a good example of what type of question can be in a non-calculator, what you're really going to be asked to do without a calculator, and what they're looking for as far as justifications for your answers. So I'm going to go through the entire problem, and you can kind of decide if you want to just look at it now, try to do all four parts, and then play the rest of the video and check your work. Or if you want to go one part at a time, I am going to do one, each part per slide. So there will be a chance to kind of check your work and then pause and then work on the next piece. So what we're working with this this problem, it's a particle motion problem. And we have a, um, they, they go through, I guess particle motion isn't the best. They're not really talking right and left here. They're, they're doing more of a function analysis, I guess is a better explanation for this. But it's a generic one. And you'll notice right away when they give this particular function, you see a K right away, which even though this isn't an actual AP test, that is such a, a signature piece of what you'll see on the AP test. We have a, this particular function, k is represented as a constant. We are looking to see when the function's increasing. We're looking for maximum value. We're looking about concavity, minimum value. So really, everything that we do in a curve sketching type problem, minus the fact that we actually are not actually sketching anything here. We're just going through and get, uh, going through a lot of the parts of a function. So part A wants to know when in the interval is the function on what interval is the function increasing? So we know that increasing, I need to take the first derivative. You really want to get in the habit of labeling your work clearly. So when you take a derivative, write down what it's the derivative of. So I have f prime. Uh, the derivative of k is a 0. So my derivative of 12x is 12. And then plus 6x minus 6x squared. So the first thing they will be looking for is do you derive it correctly? And we are going to need to find the critical values, so I'm going to factor. I'm going to take a 6 out, giving me 2 plus x minus x squared. And then I'm going to go through and factor it completely. It factors 2 minus x, 1 plus x. So we get critical values of x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. We're going to set up intervals. And my intervals are going to go from negative infinity to negative 1 from negative 1 to 2, and from 2 to infinity. And I'm testing my derivative, so I want to clearly write that. So these pluses and minuses that you start writing actually have some sort of meaning. So when I take a number that's less than negative 1, like negative 2, and I put it into back into my derivative, I am going to get a positive times a negative. So I'm going to get a negative first derivative, and it will that tells me that the original is decreasing. Then I'm going to plug 0 in. If I plug 0 in, I get a positive times a positive, so it is positive. So my original function is increasing. And then if I put anything bigger than 2 in, I'm going to get a negative times a positive, which is a negative. So my original function is decreasing. And here's why it's important to explain. If you stop here and say, well, that means that it is, um, I want to know when it is increasing, so it's increasing from negative 1 to 2, and you just stop right there, you potentially won't get the final point, which is the justification. The statement that you need to say is, because the derivative is positive in the interval, negative 1 to 2, it is increasing on that interval. So making a connection between the sign of the derivative and what that means. So writing that one line, because f prime of x, you can write that instead of the word the derivative, is positive on the interval, negative 1 to 2, f of x is increasing um, on this interval, or in this interval. So writing that one sentence is explains your work, gives you a better chance of getting every point. I believe that this could potentially be worth three points. Because you are looking at deriving it correctly and finding those critical values, testing the critical values, uh, testing your intervals uh, that are created by those critical values, getting the right answer of from negative 1 to 2. And it would not matter if you use brackets or parentheses or if you use less than sign, if you write it more as an inequality statement from negative 1, less than x, less than 2. All of that would be fine, but to get the final point, you need to make sure you're saying why. Not, don't just rely on your little sign chart with your pluses and minuses. Tell the reader that you understand that it's a positive derivative, so that means your original function is increasing. And don't use words like it. You want to be specific what it means.
Part B, I believe, would be worth two points. It's telling us that if there's a rex, if a the relative maximum value of f is four, then what's the value of k? So we need to figure out when the maximum value occurs, and we can use a lot of what we did in part A. We already figured out in part A. If you go look back to your intervals, I'm going to kind of rewrite them. If we go from negative infinity to negative one, negative one to two, and from two to infinity, you wouldn't need to rewrite this because you already did it before. What we already had. We've determined that the maximum value would have to occur at 2. And again, to justify that, we have a maximum value. We have a maximum value occurring at x equals 2 because f of x switches from positive to negative. So that's why I know that there is a maximum value at x equals 2. So I'm going to plug 2 into my original function. They're telling me the relative maximum value of f is 4. This is a y value. Notice they didn't use the word the x-coordinate of. The x-coordinate of the maximum is actually at 2. What this is saying is the maximum value, the actual high point that that's at, is at a height of 4. So what that means is the maximum must occur at the point 2, 4. Sorry, my pen went a little crazy there. Occurs at the point 2, 4. I need to plug those points in to my original function to figure out k. So if I look at my original function, which I put at the top of the screen, 4 equals k plus 12 times 2 plus 3 times 2 squared minus 2 times 2 cubed. And I don't have a calculator, so I'm not going to reach for one. I have, when I start doing my arithmetic, k plus 24 plus 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12 minus 2 cubed is 8 times 2 is 16. I have 36 minus 16, I have 20, so 4 equals k plus 20. Subtract 20 from both sides, so that tells me that k equals negative 16. I think this part, this problem will be worth two points. Uh, one of those points is coming from realizing what the, not only what the x value is, but realizing that once you find the x value and your y value, you have to plug it in correctly. And then the final point would be just getting the answer of negative 16. Um, you'll notice that they never use the word justify, so I wrote enough to explain why I know there's a maximum there, but I don't need to do anything more once I get to the final piece of k equals negative 16. Part C of this problem wants to know what interval where, uh, would be um, where the function is concave up. So with concavity, I need the second derivative. So I already have the first derivative. So I'm going to take one more derivative from that. So my second derivative, and I want to label clearly, is 6 minus 12x. I can factor out a 6. So I have 6, 1 minus 2x equals 0. So that tells me that we have a possible point of inflection at x equals a half. A lot of times with points of inflection and concavity, they're not as picky with the justification, but I'm going to try to be really specific on this. I know then that I'm going to look at what's going on before and after a half. If I plug a number like 0 in that's less than a half, my second derivative, uh, my second derivative ends up being positive, which tells me that my original function is concave up. And then if I put a number bigger than 1 half in, like 1, I get a negative second derivative, which tells me the original is concave down. This problem wanted, this part wanted to know when it is concave up. So my answer would be that it's concave up from negative infinity to a half. Or I can write it as when x is less than a half. Or I can write it with brackets or an equals in sign. That would be perfectly fine. I am going to put the reason, again, it wants justify. And my justification is because the second derivative is positive in this interval. So you're, again, using the sign, the idea of when things are positive and negative and what things are positive and negative, specifically the second derivative here, to justify your, your concavity. And the last part, part D, um, would be um, wanting to find where the relative minimum value is. And you may already guess what the most common mistake here is. The common mistake is only listing the x value. They did not say where is the 
x coordinate of the minimum value, they want to know the relative minimum value. That is the y value. Or you could probably write your answer as the entire coordinate. That would be acceptable as well. Something that takes the time to find the y value and not just the x value to get full credit here. So looking back with what I already did in part A, and again, I don't need to rewrite it, but I'm going to put it up here so we're all looking at it together. The intervals that I tested back at the beginning, I did in A and I used them in part B, already showed me that my original function went from decreasing to increasing to decreasing. So from this information, I can say that x equals negative 1 would be a relative minimum because the derivative switches from negative to positive. So I've justified why it's a relative minimum. A lot of times students stop there and reali don't realize that they need to go on because they really want the y value. They want to know how low this function actually gets. So to finish the problem off, I'm going to take negative 1 and plug it into the original function. Now, um, when you're looking at this, we already know what k is because we found k in part c, so it is important to use that information. So when I look at this original function, I now can replace k with negative 16. So that is something that if you get stuck on c, it's going to hurt you a little bit in d. So I have negative 16 plus 12 times negative 1, and then plus 3 times negative 1 squared and then minus 2 times negative 1 cubed, and again, can't use a calculator, so we're just going to go through this by hand. So we have negative 16 minus 12 plus 3. You end up with a negative times a negative, so plus 2. Negative 12 minus, uh, negative 16 minus negative, or minus 12 is negative 28, plus 5, we get negative 23. So my minimum value is actually negative 23. You are welcome to write it as a coordinate, negative 1, negative 23. But if you don't take the time to find the y value, you will not get full credit on that. Uh, my belief on a problem like this is that you get three points for part A. Uh, one is finding the derivative correctly. One is setting up intervals to figure out where it is increasing versus decreasing. And one is for that explanation, the idea that I know when it is increasing because that's when the derivative is positive. Part B, I believe, will be worth two points. Uh, one point comes from uh, realizing when the maximum occurs, that it occurs at x equals 2. And then one point would come from actually putting the information in and finding the k value of negative 16. Part C would also be worth two points. Uh, one point would come from um, taking and using the second derivative successfully. And then one point coming from explaining uh, when, when it is concave up and why. And that why is nothing more than saying that's when the second derivative is positive. And then part D would be worth two points. Um, one point realizing that um, you know the, the minimum value happens when x is negative 1 because of it's when the derivative switches from negative to positive. And then the final point from getting the y value value because that is the minimum value. Or if they were asking for maximum value, they want the y coordinate of the particular point.